Hi folks, Jeff here. Uh, gonna make another video. Hopefully an improvement over the less than stellar attempt uh, for the first video on putting the belt on the uh, South Bend lathe. Um, today's video is on adding a tachometer to a J-head bridge port. This is my J-head bridge port uh, that I picked up on Craigslist. Uh, I converted it to a CNC but still sometimes I use it in manual mode and also um, it's nice to know what the what the spindle speed is. I guess old school people go and, and use the, the name tag, which mine is worn off, um, figure out the pulley speed and then figure out the spindle speed. Uh, of course, I have a PWM on there so the spindle speed can be anything and the pulleys don't really help you that much. Um, there's there's lots of ways that that you can do this right so one way is you can uh, you can use one of these which is a optical you know laser um, tachometer and basically you put a uh, reflective piece of tape on the spindle and then do this and it, it will tell you what the speed is but then you have to have this thing the battery in mine is always dead and uh, the tape falls off and it's great for if you just want to see what your fan belt on your car is doing or something um, but for this it really for something permanent it's, it's not really great I wanted something that would be on a display that I could see what what the spindle speed was uh, there's a couple sensors that you can use to do this um, one is an inductive sensor where you put it on uh, a gear and try to figure out how many pulses of the gear um, there are the problem with that is uh, most of those sensors don't go to a high enough speed if you have lots of gear teeth. So the better way, I think, is to use a Hall effect sensor. If you don't know what a Hall effect sensor is, it doesn't matter. Uh, all that you need to know is that it pulses on and off every time a magnet goes by it. Um, they're all over eBay and Amazon for dirt cheap. I think this set is like $12 or something, or $20. It's, it's amazing. Um, but basically, you end up with a sensor this is the sensor you put the magnet in front of it and uh, every time the magnet goes by you get a pulse you count the number of pulses you know what the time is and it tells you how fast it's going so then the issue becomes where do you put that on a bridge port there are other videos that i have seen where people try to put something down underneath the the, the quill the quill is the part that goes up and down right the spindle is the, the spindle but the thing is, this thing is spinning and there's oil and um, it, it moves. And so what ends up happening is it's a mess. And then you have to have a wire that goes up there. So I didn't want to put anything below, um, below the machine. That leaves the whole upper part with the pulleys. Uh, maybe you could put something on one of the pulleys, put the sensor in the housing. Uh, that would be a bad attempt, though. Um, if you did that, it would work great in high speed because the front pulley is the speed of the spindle in high speed, but in low speed, there's a gearing that takes place and now the pulley is no longer the speed of the, of the spindle. So that would be bad. So I tried to look for all kinds of other places inside the machine that you could, that you could attach to, which would give you the spindle. The only thing that I came up with was the drawbar. So the drawbar, of course, is the thing that uh, pulls up the collet. It has to be the speed of the spindle. So this is attached to the bit. That's what I decided to do. Um, I put the Hall effect sensor on a mount. And again, right, the other considerations are I didn't want it to be in the way. So you're usually, you know, pulling this or, or, or using the brake or using the, you know, to tighten the, the, the drawbar. Um, I didn't want something to be in the way that you can mount it very easily so there are studs that stick up through try to focus in on one um, these are the the mounts for the for the brake for the spindle brake and so they are threaded into the housing so the only nut function here is just to lock it you could take this off and nothing falls down inside there um, and you'll just be left with the stud and then I put a couple spacers I could have bought regular spacers, um, you know, for a uh, for a piece of all thread, and that would have worked. Um, unfortunately, I found them in a box long after I made these. So, if you just make a uh, uh, a spacer with a tapped five sixteenths eighteen portion, 
take the nut off, spin it on there. There's one on the other side. I put a piece of one inch aluminum block that I had. I threaded the, uh, threaded it. It's a uh, M12-1 tap. Um, you could have just drilled a, a, you know, a hole through there and put two nuts on the end, but you know, why not? You're going through the effort. Um, but the, the key to the whole thing is to put the magnets on the draw bar. As we said, the magnets go by the, uh, the Hall effect sensor and that's what you know, gives you the pulse. Um, so you have to put the magnets inside there. Uh, so I milled a slot, put them on there, and then you're saying, well, why did you put all of those magnets, right? You only need the magnet where the, where the Hall effect sensor is. Well, if you've never used a bridge port, and if you're watching this, you probably have one, so you know what happens. Um, when the quill goes up and down, the draw bar goes up and down. And so if you only put a couple magnets, you're only gonna get the reading at a certain spot. Now, a reasonable person would say, what's the difference when you start drilling or milling, bring it to the top, figure out what the speed is and then continue. That's just not in my nature, couldn't do it. So uh, what I did was put a series of magnets, they're cheap enough, uh, in the draw bar, not at the top where the tool goes and you know they don't affect anything else and you can get the speed everywhere. So let me turn it on here in the manual mode. You'll see you get the, uh, the speed. Now, again, this display is like $20 and so it has some filtering in it and it's not really great for all speeds, but if you let it go for, you know, a few seconds, it settles out and gives you the correct uh, speed. I verified it a bunch of different ways. Um, if you turn it down, Slowly, uh, it will eventually catch up. Uh, at really low speeds, it takes a while because of the way that it, that it has to count on the filtering. Um, but it does settle out and you get the correct, uh, the correct speed. Um, and if you're wondering if the quill goes up and down, um, does it stay the same? You go over here and... You know, raise it up and down and you can see see the spindle going down and you can see it maintains the, uh, the rotational speed so shut that off that's how I did it now I'd like to go through and tell you about uh, some of the choices I made and uh, what magnets I chose and, and how it works Let's talk about the draw bar for a second. So we've already established that I think that the best place to put the magnets is inside the draw bar um, at the top. This is the original draw bar that came in my bridge port. It's short at the top. So what ends up happening is it goes down. It's only four and a half inches, um, four and five eighths. It ends up going down through the top of the bridge port. And so the magnets would not be in front of the Hall effect sensor. There are actually longer ones that you can buy, and they're very cheap. I bought this draw bar combination on eBay for like $20. Um, and what this allows you to do is have extra space at the top for the tool, and then also uh, not go down all the way into the machine when the quill is going down. So, mill a slot in here, put the magnets like uh, are on my machine. Uh, the thing is, though, the draw bars don't last forever. And so what ends up happening is the threads at the other end eventually, you know, go bad. And then you have to change out the draw bar. Well, if you've gone to all the effort to mill a slot to put the magnets in, not that it was a huge deal, but, you know, it was work. Um, I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if I could just remove the top part and keep the, uh, just swapping out the, the bottoms. Now, this is a dual use, I guess, uh, draw bar. If you look, the threads are long at the bottom. And with the, the draw bar, you get these, these spacers and the spacers sit right about here. Uh, and then that allows you to keep removing the spacers, cut a little bit off of the, 
threads and then you end up using the same drawbar for multiple times. Now, to be truthful, this drawbar will probably last me forever because I have a day job and I don't machine all day long, but I can imagine if you use it all the time, um, the drawbar will go bad. So I decided, wouldn't it be a great idea if you could separate this two? Well, this is threaded and sits up inside here. This one's broken off because of a whole ordeal, but they use a blind hole and drive a spring pin uh, in here. And blind means that it doesn't go all the way through to the other side. And so if you want to remove this spring pin, you know, lots of people have ways you can put a screw in there and try a slide hammer. Um, you can't drill it because it's hardened. You can't, um, thread it because it's hardened. Um, believe me, all these things I know. Um, so the only way that I could get this out was to go to the opposite side and not on this one, uh, drill the hole exactly opposite this one and then drive it out with a pin. If you do that, then you can reuse the, um, the drawbar top if the drawbar goes bad. Uh, you know, looking back, I should have probably just made a couple of these and it would have been easier and that would have been that. Would have been that. But so that's the, the consideration with the, uh, with the drawbar. So let's talk about the Hall Effect sensor. So the Hall Effect sensor has three wires. And earlier in the video, I sort of lied a little bit when I said that you get a pulse out of the Hall Effect sensor. You actually do not. The Hall Effect sensor by itself does not uh, provide a, a pulse. What the Hall Effect sensor has inside it is a transistor, an NPN transistor. So we're not gonna get deep into this, but just to give you a little background of so what this looks like, that's a a transistor called an NPN transistor. There's a PNP. No one cares. Uh, the beauty of a transistor is that you can give a little bit of signal on one terminal and control a big signal on the other two terminals. That's the that's the crux of a transistor. Um, so it's just like a relay, sort of, um, except it works on current. Um, and the reason that they don't just say it's a Hall effect sensor that has a switch. that opens and closes is because a switch, like a reed switch, only goes back and forth so many times and then breaks. But a transistor does not. As long as you don't heat it up too hot, it will last virtually forever. Heat is what causes semiconductors to go bad. So um, inside the Hall effect sensor, you have access to this, this wire. This side is connected to ground and this part that works the the transistor is connected to the the hall effect um, sensor so uh, when a magnet comes near the hall effect sensor it allows current to flow this way so earlier when i said you would get a signal out you really get nothing all you get is this the the switch closes um, so it takes one of the terminals the terminal that's coming out um, and connects it to ground so, and you could do it many times. So a Hall effect sensor doesn't just have to be used for a tachometer. You could use it to determine if a door is closed or if you're at the end of the travel or something. Um, so, uh, and, and by the way, they, they have Hall effect sensors that have different transistors and they have ones that are, so this, this transistor or this uh, Hall effect sensor is normally open, which means that, that it's normally open. And when you bring the magnet to it, it closes. And so when I said before that you get a pulse out, um, the reason that it looks like you get a pulse out is because if you attach it to the uh, meter, the meter has a resistor to pulled up to plus voltage. And so then if you look at it, you actually will get a pulse. So let's take a look and see if what I'm telling you is actually true. Um, so here I have the Hall effect sensor attached to the meter and also to a voltmeter. So the way that all these things work is you give them uh, voltage and ground and you have to give the, the meter voltage and ground. And this particular sensor says it works from five to 30 volts. Um, I think you should probably run it at 12. This is made in China. I don't know how, you know, how well it's gonna work at the, at the extremes, but I know that it works at 12. But in any case, I have the signal wire, which happens to be the black wire on, uh, on, on this sensor. 
Uh, actually, you can go to just about any website up on the screen here, and you can see that this sensor, the 5002C, has black is out, uh, blue is ground, and then the, the uh, positive voltage. And on this one, it says 6 to 36 volts, and so the same exact part number on different websites, it's 5 to 30. Um, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt. It's not a uh, USA made company device. I'm sure you could buy them from, from reputable companies and get better industrial ones, but like I said, for a few bucks, what's the difference? Um, so if we look at the voltmeter, you'll see it's pulled up to uh, 9 volts. I think I have power supply set to 12, um, but there's some internal circuitry that pulls it up to 9 because there's a voltage regulator. So if what I'm telling you is true, if we take a magnet and we bring the magnet close to the... Uh, let me bring this a little closer here. To the device it goes to zero. Take it away, goes to nine, put it back. Now, the only thing about a Hall effect device is it's uh, polarity dependent, I guess, or magnetic polarity dependent. So it needs this, this particular one needs the south pole of a magnet. So if you put the other side of the magnet, nothing happens. See, it stays at nine, take this, goes to zero. You can also see about how far away it works now they give you a magnet with it and then they tell you what the the range is it says 10 millimeters so if you get this hall effect sensor um, and uh, and use their magnet it will detect within 10 millimeters so three-eighths of an inch or something um, but if you use a stronger magnet like I have uh, you can actually maybe go to half an inch um, or more I suppose depending on how strong the magnet is Anyway, you, you can also see on the display, right? Move the, uh, the magnet, it starts counting. So when you go to put these magnets in the, um, in the draw bar, you really need to check each one. You put a dot on it with a marker or something to make sure you don't put it in upside down because it's virtually impossible to get out amongst the rest of them when it's pushed up tight and down into a slot. Um, so you want to make sure that you have it going the right way before you go ahead and put all 20 of the, uh, the magnets together. If the magnet is on the drawbar and the drawbar is spinning, then the magnet, of course, will want to fly off the drawbar. So the question becomes, will the magnet stay on the drawbar or will the magnet fly off? And uh, if so, do we have to epoxy the magnet down onto the into the slot on the drawbar. So two ways you could figure this out. Uh, one way, put the drawbar on the machine, put the magnet on there, turn it on, put on some goggles, and see if the magnet flies off. Uh, that's one way. The second way is to calculate and use physics and see if the the magnet's going to fly off. So um, I have done both so far. Uh, because I calculated it first, and then, of course, I turned it on and saw that it didn't fly off. Um, but let's go through the calculation. It's actually pretty easy if you make just a couple of assumptions. So let's start with this circle. And we have an object on the circle. And Newton's first law says that an object is going to continue in a straight line. So it's going to want to continue going straight. If you want it to go around in a circle, you have to apply a force inward to counteract the force outward. So the equation for that uh, turns out to be fairly simple for a circle. And I'm not going to derive it here. You can find it on the internet. Um, but Newton's second law is force of course equals mass times acceleration and for a circle the force is equal to the mass times pi times n which is the rotational speed in rpm divided by 30 squared times the radius which is how far 
you are from the center. We need to know just a few things. We need to know the force. We need to know the mass. Um, of course, we're trying to figure out how fast it will spin around. So that's N and the radius. This is the cutaway of the draw bar with the magnet milled in. As we can see, it's three quarters of an inch across the flats. I think that's the same for all Bridgeport draw bars. All the tools that you buy seem to be three quarters of an inch. So uh, it's a pretty safe bet. Um, you could see the magnet milled into the, into the flat in the center. Um, we're using this to try to find out the radius. Now, if the magnet were not symmetrical, which it is, um, and it was not equal density, this would be a much more difficult problem because you would have to use calculus to be able to determine the force associated with each bit of, um, of magnet and the radiuses would all be different and you would have to integrate and not impossible, um, but certainly not trivial, right? We could take advantage of the fact that it is symmetrical and we happen to know that the magnet is two tenths of an inch thick. That's this portion. So if we want to take the center of mass and assume a point mass where all of the, uh, the mass is concentrated, it would be in the center right there, which would be a tenth of an inch away from uh, half the diameter. So it would be three eighths minus a tenth. So that would be our, our radius. And then we can go back to our equation and calculate. I printed this because my handwriting is awful. Um, the key to getting the correct value is to keep everything in the same measurement system. So in the imperial measurement system, uh, pounds, um, feet, seconds, we are given the magnetic force, the weight of the magnet, and we know the radius. So where did we get this? Um, the magnet I bought from a company called K and J Magnetics online, uh, not a sponsor, um, but uh, they have a great website and the magnets were very inexpensive. The, you know, you could go to Amazon and buy magnets, but then it'll say, oh, here's some magnets that you can put on the refrigerator to hold your kid's art, right? If you go to this website, it will tell you what the force is. So it's 3.07 pounds. Uh, it tells you the weight, 0.0426 ounces or 1.207 grams, the diameter, um, all that kind of stuff. If you go to technical, it'll explain to you what the different uh, pull force cases are where you get the the uh the force from one is just the magnetic or the magnet on a um piece of metal the other one is the magnet sandwiched between two pieces of metal uh so very informative and um good website again not a sponsor but that's where i got the numbers from. if we go back to our equation um of course we have the the force is 3.07 pounds uh, we need the mass so we have the weight is 0.0426 you need the mass. There's tons of calculators online and you'll get the mass. Uh, if you use the, the kilogram system, uh, you don't have to do that because kilograms are mass. There is no confusion. Uh, in the imperial system, force is in pounds and the mass is in pound mass. <laughs> but in the uh, metric system, kilograms are always mass. Uh, if that's all confusing to you, don't worry. All the online calculators take care of this for you. My whole point of this is if you put the correct numbers in, you will get the correct value. If you don't, you will end up with ridiculous numbers. So if you take these values, put it in, use a calculator, we get 12,153 RPM. Um, that's great because a bridge port, stock bridge port goes up to about 3000 RPM. So there's no possible way that it can fly off. Even if you have the super duper high speed head bridge port, it's 5,000 RPM. So still not gonna fly off. Um, just to show you that I did it both ways. Uh, how did I do it? I have the same calculation uh, using the international system, MKS, right? Uh, meters, kilogram, seconds. Uh, you start out with the same 3.07 pounds. You convert that to a force of 13.656 newtons. 
Uh, of course, mass is mass in the MKS system, so you don't have to worry about doing any conversion. So uh, it's 1.207 grams, but you have to get to kilograms. So we got to divide by 1,000, of course. Um, the radius is in meters, right? So um, if you do these things correctly, you get the same 12,153 RPM as you would expect since uh, RPM is the same in both. You might be asking, why did I go with a bunch of cylindrical magnets? Those magnets are a quarter inch wide by two tenths of an inch deep, and there are 20 something of them up and down. Um, why would I use those instead of a single rectangular magnet um, that would fit in the same slot, or at least maybe you know a few smaller magnets instead of the 20 something magnets that are in there? And the reason that is, is because of how magnets are made and which ones are available. So there are obviously rectangular magnets. Um, I have these right here that I use to hold the screwdrivers from falling off all the time. Um, and they're very strong. You know, they would work. So why did I choose the, the magnets that I chose? Here is our cylindrical magnet. So if we draw the magnet this way and we put the Hall effect sensor here, this magnet happens to be an axially magnetized magnet. What that means is that in the two tenths of an inch direction, it is split down the middle. And this is the south, and this is the north. And if you magnetize it that way, the magnetic field lines go like this. If you remember back to seventh grade, I guess. Go from north to the south. And the strength of the magnet is on the ends. So here and here. So every time that the magnet goes around and goes by the Hall effect sensor, we get a... Um, we get an output. So, if we take a long magnet, and we have our Hall effect sensor right here, just like before, but we take a really tall magnet, let's say, rectangular magnet, if that magnet were axially magnetized, just like the um, cylindrical magnet, and it was in the long direction, that would not work because you would end up with the north and the south like this. And then, of course, when this goes up and down and it's going around in a circle, um, not only would it switch from north to south, but also the lines would go like this. And the strong part of the magnet at the bottom or the top um, would not be near the sensor. It would be the weak part of the magnet that's out here. So what you would really like is to have a magnet that is diametrically magnetized. And what that means comes down like this. is that the magnet would be split this way so that you'd have the, the south, let's say, and the north. Then, when it passed by the magnet, you would have the strong part of the magnet because the lines would go like this from the, from the one half to the other half. And the strong part of the magnet would be here, right? And so that would be great. Um, unfortunately, it is very hard to find a tall, thin, diametrically magnetized magnet. Most of them that I found were axially magnetized. So there was one that was a half inch tall, so I guess I could have um, used that one. Um, but unfortunately, instead of being two tenths of an inch thick, it was uh, an eighth of an inch thick and I had already milled the slot. So in the perfect world, if there were a diametrically magnetized magnet that, were, that was four and a half inches tall, 
um, and two tenths of an inch thick, it would be perfect. And you could use just one magnet and you wouldn't have to put all those smaller magnets. Um, but because I couldn't find them, I use this magnet. Here's the similar setup that I put on the lathe. Um, it's a different sensor. It's a little bit shorter than the, than the other sensor. Um, same exact principle, a little different magnet that I used this time. Um, I pulled off the, uh, the collet closer so you could see it better, um, but works exactly the same way. So if we turn it on. This particular display seems to be a little quicker in response than the, the one on the bridge port, just the different you know, Chinese brand that I bought on, on Amazon. Um, Same principle. Well, that's going to do it for this video. Hopefully, you found something of value that you can use in your own project. Thanks for watching.